I felt that, that really there was one final question that hasn't been asked, much less answered. And as a consultant and a problem solver, as I reflected upon this, I thought, I'm not doing right by you if I don't ask and answer that question. And that question is, performance, values, and culture, why? Why should you embrace creating a performance and values-driven culture for your team? We haven't asked the question, we haven't answered it, but we're going to do that today. And the answer is really simple and succinct. Competitive advantage. Now, with that as a backdrop, what is competitive advantage? The top bullet pretty much says what it is, and, and it is what you think it is. Attributes and practices that allow an organization to outperform its competitors, and it's driven by a strategy. Really, what I want to spend some time are what are the key components to competitive advantage? And they are differentiation and sustainability. Differentiation and sustainability are to competitive advantage as H2 and O is the water. Sustainability is what, is what you think it is. It's your ability to maintain a performance, which as coaches is one of the big challenges that you face. Now here, the whole point is dynamic versus static environments. The reality within which we all exist is dynamic. It's fluctuating. As soon as you reach a point, there's forces that are pushing you back. You, know, you, you, get in, you get in a top shape, you get a head cold, you can't work out for a week, you go back to the gym, and clearly you're not what you were. The environment that you're in is dynamic, it's not static. You can't get to a point and hit pause. Now, the role and impact of culture is significant, which is part of the thesis as to why I think performance values and culture can be a source of competitive advantage. <coughs> but culture, differentiation, your culture to the extent that people are bought into what you're doing and how you're doing it is going to help you basically perform and implement more effectively. One. Two, to the extent that you fully embrace culture, that it's not lip service, that your culture is not just a slogan that's painted on a locker room wall. To the extent that that is fundamental to who you are as an organization or as a team or a program, that can be one of your differentiators. Culture also impacts sustainability because your culture, the degree to which people are aligned and bought in, is going to allow you to maintain performance at the level that you want. In the absence of this, it's just going to be subject to the ebb and flow of a dynamic reality, and you're never going to know what you get. Thus, one of my fundamentals, you may not be able to read, <coughs> but hope is not a strategy. I'm just going to hope if I say it, it'll stick and maybe it'll work out. I wouldn't be banking my career on hope. And if you fall prey to these false positives, what you're basically doing is you're labeling a bunch of things you're doing as we've got a competitive advantage because of this. You're this, you're this guy with the blindfold. You're operating blind and sadly you don't even know it. Thus, the need to pay attention to that. The real key here is to ask yourself, is what we're doing competitive advantage or is it competitive convergence? Competitive convergence is a business term. And what ends up happening as businesses see and steal and copy from competitors, over the course of time, the companies in a sector all of a sudden amalgamate into just one big version of everybody else. So what you think is competitive advantage is really competitive inversion. It's just our version of everybody else. And the danger is, if you're thinking we're doing these things and it's competitive advantage, when in fact all you're really doing is participating in competitive convergence and you're tricking yourself into thinking you've got an edge when in fact you don't. So, now, the thesis trying to draw it together to answer the question I posed at the beginning. If C equals P plus B, if your culture is a function of performance plus values, based upon what I've just shared with you, I believe, drawing from my own business experience, I believe a performance and values aligned team culture is a source 
of differentiated and sustainable competitive advantage and insulation from competitive convergence. That's why you do it. You don't do it because it's trendy. You don't do it because other people are doing it. And it's a heck of a lot more than a slogan in the locker room. That's why you do it. What we've been doing, and I'm going to go really quick here because we, we kind of, we've covered this. This emanates from this four quadrants that, that people who are DLA veterans have seen. It emanates from Jack Welch at General Electric, who was intrigued with what makes our best performers our best performers. And in the midst of that analysis, he saw a break that there was the best of the best, and then there was the best. And when they were looking downstream, the same thing held true about lower performers. There was some low performance that was significantly better than others. And they dug further, and it was like cultural alignment. Those that embody GE's values and processes and protocols were part of the people on the left side. That's where this comes from. And what we've got, you've got here, this is your, your 20 and 10 player who doesn't really care about anything except getting his or her 20 and 10. They're, you know, the culture killers, the change killers, the locker room problems are your high performer who's not bought in. And they exist in the business world. I dealt with these folks all the time. They're everywhere. Low performer, low values, hiring mistake, <coughs> recruiting mistake. Jack Walsh's view, once you figure out who they are, get rid of them. G had a thing, they were looking to exit the bottom 20% of the, of, of the company every year. Over here, high performer, high values, your stars. And over here, low performer, high values, bought in, good program player, in a couple of years, going to give you significant minutes, and they're probably going to be successful in life, and 10 years from now, they're going to write you a big check. So that's the foundation of what we've been talking about. And with Coach O'Brien's assistance, we came up with a four-step model. I'm going to go real fast. First thing, you've got to then define what is performance and values within the context of your team and program. And you've got to define it behaviorally. I'm around for the rest of the day, tonight and tomorrow. So anybody that wants to grab me, if particularly if you weren't here last year, I've got last year's presentation, I can take you through it. But the people haven't paid good money to hear me do last year's stuff. That's like a comedian doing a little material. So first one, you've got to define performance and values, and you define it behaviorally, because then you can measure it. Second, once you've defined it, now you can start plotting players. If, you know, in the absence of a definition, you can't plot. So where in these four quadrants do they reside? And what you're doing as coaches, you're trying to get people up and to the right. Up, better players, to the right, more aligned. Step three, once you've done that, you rank them. What have we got? At Harvard, they're always saying, what cards have you been dealt? This, what cards have I been dealt? What am I dealing with here? Do I have a roster full of what type? And there'll be some more in normal distribution. But you need to know what you're dealing with, and you can also rank them by position. And lastly, once you classify them, you come up with what we call a player improvement plan. What's the plan to get them more aligned with your values? Now, if you've never defined your values, how do you expect to hold them people accountable for being bought in? It's impossible. Likewise, performance. What do we need to do to get people to be better? In the high 90s of percent on these deals that I've referenced, we're in agreement, we're trying to get to four. The problem and the challenge comes is, well, how are we going to get there? And I learned, leave yourself open to the possibilities. As you reflect upon what I've talked about today, competitive advantage, strategy, change management, the quadrants, how do we manipulate and work the quadrants, leave yourself open to the possibilities. That, go back to that question, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to win or be right? because there's multiple ways of getting to four. And as long as you can get to four within the time frame that you have, that's all that really counts. And I do believe, looking at what we've done over the last four years, the change management, deep dive on performance values culture, the model, and now the reason why, what you all want is that one magical moment where you're cutting down the next 
I believe with your, with your drive and your capability and with what you're going to learn from sessions such as these, that your commitment to performance, values, and culture can be a catalyst in putting you in position for your experience that moment.